What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome, Noah, back to the HQ. Today, we are diving back into rookies. On Wednesday, we covered our running backs. We covered all the backs that we like, which were not plentiful because this class sucks at the running back position. Wide receivers, though, we got a whole different story going on. So, myself and Noah at Fantasy FB God on Twitter are going to break down the entire wide receiver class. Tell you who we like, who we don't like, who we're taking at the 101, some surprises at the combine, winners, losers, um, and some under their weight, under the radar wide receivers in this rookie class. So 2019 fantasy football, top rookie wide receivers coming at you. Noah, what's cracking? Welcome back to the HQ, my man. Thanks for having me on. Excited to talk about this stuff. You know, as you said before, the running backs are kind of garbage. So it makes more than makes up for it with these receivers. A bunch of athletic freaks out here. I know, dude. Everyone's looking like you over there. You know, <laughs> I'm telling you, when you told me you were fucking what, – what did you say? You're 6'3 or 6'4? Yeah, I'm like 6'3 and half, 6'4. Not like that Metcalf build, though. I'm trying to get there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I think I could tell that through the video. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I've never been able to tell that you were that tall, to be honest, because I've only ever seen you from the nipples up. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk some wide receivers. And I think – for people that are looking at fantasy football, I think this early in the summer, most of them are probably, or this it's still the fucking winter, but uh, most of them are probably <laughs> looking at dynasty stuff. So with dynasty being the main focus, let's talk about the 101. For me, and I know we've actually talked about this, there's one pick at 101 and there's nowhere else I'm looking. Who are you taking at the 101? It's got to be Nikhil Harry, just because he's the only one that really offers the blend of upside and floor. Like you got a guy like Metcalf, who I, I think of him as like a cruise ship. You keep him in a straight line, it's going to work out pretty well. You start to like veer to the right and the left in his routes, it's like a whole Titanic situation. The guy is just a mess. He can't turn. His three-cone drill was absolutely disgusting. I mean, like he's got the upside for sure. But like a guy like Nikhil Harry, who had back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons, eight touchdowns, uh, he's really versatile on the field, can be used left, right, into the slot. Any team that gets him is going to be able to implement him right away. And plus, he's using, like, punt and kick returns, just further showing, like, his open field ability. I think there's not really another way you can go with the 101. Yeah, I agree with you there, man. Harry is the real deal. He, he reminds me of, of Jarvis Landry or, like, Keenan Allen, but he is six foot two, 228 pounds. So, like, the size doesn't make sense. And he's a really young prospect as well. Like, he just turned 21 years old. And that's something to really consider when you're looking at wide receivers when it comes to dynasty. Like some of these guys are at a sneaky old age. Um, so Nikhil Harry not only has the production, like you said, back-to-back uh, -back thousand yard receive, uh, receiving yard seasons, over 73 catches in both of those years, uh, eight touchdowns. And like one of the best parts about that is, like you said, he's a, he's a special teams guy. Like how many players do you see that are 6'2", 228, that have tons of screens designed for them that are returning punts and kicks and doing so successfully. So it shows he's not just like a red zone target or a downfield threat. He is an athlete in every sense of the word. So uh, I agree in that he has, a, has the safest floor probably of any of these wide receivers in this class, but like arguably has one of the top ceilings, if not just as high as DK Metcalf. Um, so he's the, he's the one-on-one for me for sure, just because it's such a down year for, um, for running backs overall. So that, that's one point for you, Noah you're getting on my good side right now but let's talk about some combine <laughs> winners and losers so harry was a harry was a winner i think he didn't get to the level of metcalf but he was good enough to the point where i'm excited about him because i wasn't sure if he was going to end up running like a four six five but he he came in um he did his thing at i think it was like a four five three four, five, three yeah. yeah puts him in the 89th percentile for weight adjusted speed score was in the 77th percentile for burst score all per player profiler, broke out at a young age, um, didn't test for agility or anything, but all around good numbers for him. DK Metcalf is obviously a combine winner, but who else do you have on this list of guys who hurt or helped their, uh, their draft stock? All right. So I think in terms of like winners, guys who performed well, obviously Metcalf, uh, Paris Campbell, obviously jumped out with those 40 times and, you know, he's a quick guy, but when I think of winners, I think of guys that surprised and right. Those two guys on film, you could tell they're already fast. Uh, you could already tell Metcalf couldn't turn. So, like, the three-cone drill wasn't really a loser, per se, because you already knew, like, he didn't have that in his bag. Yep. I think winners that came out of it, two big ones were A.J. Brown and Hakeem Butler. Because the question about Brown was, like, does he have that long speed? And the fact that he ran a 4.49 at, like, 225 pounds, 
he's going to be a big slot receiver, and that's more than adequate speed. Mm-hmm. Same with Hakeem Butler, 6'5", and he ran, I think, also a 4'48 or 4'49". That just, like, affirmed the belief that he can beat defenses, and he's obviously got that size. He jumped out of the gym, and he didn't test in a three-cone drill, but if you watch him on tape, he actually runs routes other than, like, fly routes and comebacks. He can run a slant. Uh, he can run out routes. So I think if he ran the three-cone, he would have actually not, like, uh, finished, in, like, in the upper half, but I think he would have been pressed. Yeah, he wouldn't have been like Metcalf, we'll put it that way. I think that's like the telling card. If you can do better than Metcalf, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with what you did then. Yeah, I agree with you, though. I'm super, super high on A.J. Brown, uh, super high on Akeem Butler as well. I think those are probably my top three wide receivers off the board right now in order. Um, Nikhil Harry, A.J. Brown, and Hakeem Butler. Because when you look at A.J. Brown, man, he it, it's funny because the old Miss situation, they have their scheme – and they fit their guys into it, where it was, you know, they have three prospects coming into the draft. They have DK Metcalf, they have A.J. Brown, who are both possibly going to go in the first round, um, and then they have Demarcus Lodge. Like When you look at the system, A.J. Brown was the slot receiver there. He ended up playing down the stretch outside, but he's mainly a slot receiver, and you don't see that often with a guy who's uh, 220, 225 pounds. So that's the type of player that, if he's in the right system, I think his floor and ceiling combination is ridiculously high. But if he gets drafted by a team – that wants to shove him outside and try to make him, you know, beat the guys downfield. He has the speed. He did prove that on the long speed, but he is such a good slot receiver to um, kind of duplicate the style of a guy like Juju Smith-Schuster, right? One of the bigger slot receivers in the NFL today. So I love A.J. Brown there. i um, glad to see he tested well. Same thing with Akeem Butler. The one thing I would say about Akeem Butler is he'll be 23 years old soon, which is pretty old for a, um, for a prospect, wide receiver prospect coming out. And what happens with those older wide receiver prospects is like, you know, people always want to talk about how they're good route runners. And Hakeem Butler is a good route runner. I agree with you. He's a little more agile than you would think. His, his feet are good and he's able to, you know, make those breaks and get open via separation and stuff. Um, but those older wide receivers coming out are, are better route runners because they've had a few more years to develop. So that's something that I don't necessarily like put a huge piece of analysis on like if they're an older prospect and they're great route runners that that should be the case like if you're old and you're not a good route runner that's that's a pretty big red flag to me so he fits that but he has a ton of upside so I agree with you in the <laughs> sense that like he is someone whose ceiling and floor is um is really intriguing to me so those are my top three guys uh number four would you have Metcalf at four it's it's close because I really like Kelvin Harmon but his his combine I don't know it it made it kind of tough to like him yeah, but I think it's very close between those two, and obviously, a guy we're going to talk about later in this video, Andy Isabella, he could easily sneak in there. Yeah, uh, the thing with DJ DK Metcalf, um, we didn't really go too in depth on it, but I, I think we should break him down for a second. Is in that Ole Miss offense, he was exclusively uh, running routes from the left side, so he was a one side player, and seventy to seventy five percent of his routes were just literally based off his top end speed. So they were either go routes, flies or based off the speed where he's running the go routes and he's making a comeback. It was never breaking to the right or breaking in, you know, over the um, over the middle of the field. And that was telling with the agility score, which tested lower than fucking Tom Brady's. I saw a tweet that came out that he had a lower shuttle and a lower uh, three cone than Tom Brady. Literally, that his time was worse. So, <laughs> like fucking Zoolander in the sense that he, he can't turn left. So, Metcalf is a prospect that, yeah, his talent is there and the upside is definitely there. But he makes me nervous as shit. And he does not have a full season of production in in, uh, in his college career. The same thing with a guy like Josh Jacobs, who's a running back. Metcalf never went over 646 yards receiving in a season. Um, he played 12 games in 2017. But his freshman year, he was held to two games. His uh, sophomore year, he was held to seven games. So it's like he hasn't shown consistent production at a high level, you know, over that long span. So for Metcalf, there's a lot of red flags for me. Sure, the upside is there. But when you have other receivers in this class that have such high floors, like a Nikhil Harry or an A.J. Brown, there's no sense in diving to that, you know, up right up to that ceiling. So Metcalf probably comes in as the wide receiver four. I did like uh, Kelvin Harmon as well. Um, another big receiver, just, you know, another one of those guys that just fits into the mold of what this class is. But Harmon, yeah, his, uh, his combine numbers definitely scared me a little bit because I, I thought he was going to test out to be a little bit more of an athlete. And I don't want to uh, – necessarily just lean only onto his tape when I when I think of uh, Kelvin Harmon yeah so like looking at his film at first when I watched him he kind of reminded me of Alshon Jeffrey like he wasn't going to kill you with speed but he could like high point a ball and he's very physical in the run game and just boxing out defenders he catches with his hands and everything 
but Alshon Jeffrey tested, I think, over the 90th percentile in either burst or um, speed score, where Harmon was like below 50% in almost every like metric uh, when you look at playerprofiler.com. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I don't like lean too much on athleticism when I can see that the player like is good at football. Right. Like in the draft guide that we're making, I'm like working on a table that just shows uh, like a lot of receivers that finished inside the top 24 this past year who were terrible athletes. Like Keenan Allen did nothing at the combine. The guy's always, he's like a perennial top 12 guy. Right. Uh, Robert Woods even disappointed. He had an awesome year. Antonio Brown, like the best receiver we've seen like the past 10 years, the guy ran like a four, six at five foot 10. I'm not putting too, too much stock in it, but it's obviously a red flag when the guy isn't running fast or jumping high and, but he's got the size. So yeah, and obviously the pro. Yeah, I think what the combine really does a good job of is it's not necessarily like a predictor of success if you're a fantastic athlete. Like most really good, really good NFL players do happen to be really good athletes, but that that's not a criteria for success. However, on the bottom end of things, like uh, if you are a very, very poor athlete, like not Kelvin Harmon poor, but like really like Elijah Holyfield poor where you're running a four eight or a four nine or something like that. That pretty much tells you that you're not NFL athlete. Like you're not the caliber of an NFL athlete. So you can hit the top end of the spectrum, but that doesn't predict success. But the bottom end will probably tell you that you are um, not really good enough to stay in the league or not fast enough to play with the guys that are also in the league. So Kelvin Harmon, another guy you mentioned, um, did you mention Paris Campbell or am I imagining things or do I just want to bring him up really bad? No, I, I did from the winners. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, so Paris Campbell is one of those guys that absolutely uh, destroyed the combine, and he's probably a lock for a first round, if not like very early second round based on that. Um, and looking at player profiler, his best comparable is Santana Moss. I mean, a 4'3", 140 at 6'205", and that 6'205", is exactly the same you know, shape and size as a lot of these bigger slot receivers. And it's not necessarily that 6'205", is big, but – when you're when you're thinking of slot receivers, you think of like the Cole Beasleys and you think of the Adam Humphreys and stuff who are, you know, 180 pounds. So now that we see the Juju's and the Adam Thielens and those guys who are, you know, six foot two hundred to two ten, he fits in that mold. And then you add that athleticism on top of him, four three, one forty, puts him in the ninety-sixth percentile for weight adjusted speed score, um, burst score in the ninety-seventh percentile. A ridiculous athlete. And he is just twenty and a half years old. So he will be – I don't even think he'll be 21 by the time the season starts. So that's a prospect who did really well in college at a young age, and, uh, and I think he's just set up for success if he can go to a team. Like, put Paris Campbell on, on the Packers, man, and I think that, like, we're, we're going to see some serious damage done there. Yeah, it's like Randall Cobb all over him, but better. Like, Randall Cobb had a few seasons. I think he reached 12 or 13 touchdowns, but he just had injury – like, too many injuries that kept him out for way too long. When I watched him on tape, I mean, he was playing with Dwayne Haskins, who's like the number one or two quarterback coming out in this class. And I don't know why, but he didn't like uh, Paris Campbell didn't really like pop out on tape. But you could just tell he's a playmaker like after the catch. He was incredible. He was used all over the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, He topped a thousand yards and I think he hit like nine touchdowns. And as you said, he's like young. So he didn't really need to have that like 1300 yard, like 12 touchdown season, especially at that size and playing for Ohio State when they have like five-star recruits all over the place. I mean, it's pretty impressive how well he did considering he's young and that team is just like – they play elite competition and he's surrounded by other playmakers. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of Paris Campbell. Really intrigued. I'm just so intrigued to see where all of these guys go because this is a class that I feel like, especially for running backs at least, that their success is going to be 100% determined by where they end up landing. Um, and I don't know if that's the case for the wide receivers, but there are a lot of wide receiver needy teams – that I don't want to see my favorite prospects end up on. Like if Nikhil Harry ends up going to the Raiders or if he ends up going to like Buffalo or something, you know, obviously I'm not, I'm, I'm probably not going to be looking at him as the 101 where if a guy like AJ Brown ends up going to like the Packers, I'm definitely going to be taking him over Nikhil Harry for, you know, for a reason like that. Um, but you did mention something before that I want to plug into it because it is plug season. The draft guide. We are diligently working on the 2019 Big Dog Gotta Eat rookie slash dynasty draft guide we are going to be covering everything dynasty everything rookie myself noah a couple other big dogs content creators in the back end we are breaking down the top 50 or 60 rookie prospects this year uh covering everything fantasy football their outlooks the best team fit for them this will be updated pre 
and post NFL draft. Uh, it is available for pre-order right now on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. You'll save like 20% if you pre-order it. It launches March 25th. It's got everything in there. It's got rookie rankings for season long and dynasty. And it's got our full dynasty rankings as well. Exclusive articles, five mistakes that dyna new dynasty players make, and just a whole bunch of cool shit. So check out Big Dogs Draft. Oh, no. Hold on a sec. <laughs> Battery exhausted. Yeah, we're still alive, though. All right. Oh, well, he's off the screen. Order one of these also, bigdogsfantasy.com. Love that. Plug them. Plug them. <laughs> it's plug season, you know. Affordable price. Nick will probably give you a discount one of these days. Don't say that shit. <laughs> the discount on the draft guide's enough. The money you save on the draft guide put towards the hat. How about that? Love that. Ooh. Hey. <laughs> we bike. <laughs> We're so bike. All right. All right. All right, people. I apologize. All time shirt. Sure. Shut the fuck up. That's what I'm saying. Hope. I bought like 10 shirts that I'm just going to be rocking throughout the summer. So <laughs> like, just to piss people off. Where were we? We were discussing the draft guide. Yeah, go cop the draft guide. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Talked about DK Metcalf. On the flip side of things, we have a guy who is probably almost the literal opposite of DK Metcalf in Andy Isabella. Where they do match up is, is their speed. Talk to me about Andy Isabella. You mentioned him before. Do you think, you know, a, a lot of the comparisons are going to be super lazy comparisons and you see a small white guy that's fast and quick and whatever, and people assume New England, right? The next Edelman, the next Welker, the next Danny Amendola, whatever. I think there's more to that. I think a better comp is a Brandon Cooks, uh, someone like that. Where, what's your take on Andy Isabella? Yeah, when I was watching the combine and his first run came in at like four or five, seven, I was like, oh, what are you doing, Andy? You are absolutely bombing. And then you there was some fiasco where like the lasers, you know, the lasers like weren't working. And then he ran four, two, seven, but it like the official was a four, three, one. So we know the guy's fast. And I think it's unfair to kind of fit him into that Julian Edelman mold or like a Danny Amendola mold because those guys don't really hold a candle to Isabella's like speed. Obviously, their quickness is. Uh, very similar, but their lo his long speed and just like I don't really think that he's a good comparison to those guys. One guy I looked, like, I think he plays a lot like and he's built like is John Brown, who if he didn't like have to deal with those sickle cell traits, he was like on his way to becoming one of the like the better small receivers in the league. If you remember him in Arizona, he had like a one thousand yard uh, season while sharing a field with Larry Fitzgerald and Michael Floyd. Yeah, so I, mean, I think he was, he's got he a much wider skill set. He was making a comeback this year, man. John Brown was until fucking they put Lamar Jackson in, and then <laughs> that entire passing game just went out the window. Now, I had a, uh, I, I made a chart here kind of comparing Isabella to those New England wide receivers. And, you know, the left side, they're all 5'9 or 5'10. They're all like 185 to 190 pounds. Edelman's a little bit heavier. But if you look at every other metric, College dominator in terms of like production in college, Isabella was the only one that really produced at a col in college at a high level. His breakout age was far younger than any of them. 40-yard dash was in the 100th percentile compared to the other guys that were in the single digits and 38th percentile. So weight adjusted speed score. His burst and agility uh, were topped by Julian Edelman, but he was still up there close to him in terms of those things. So he basically took all the best traits of all those other wide receivers, and that's what he like encapsulates. And when you look at the chart – with him versus Cooks, they are much, much more similar. 5'9", 5'10", 188, 189. High college dominator, good breakout age. 100-yard dash is very, very – or 40-yard dash is, is very, very high up, 100th percentile. Weight adjusted speed score, both in the 77th percentile. Their burst score, 58th and 51st. Um, Brandon Cooks a little more agile, but realistically, they're kind of the same player. One's white, one's black. That's where the differences come in. So Andy Isabella, if he goes to a team, I, I just don't know if there's enough – like forward thinking coaches that are going to draft this guy and be like, yeah, we're going to use him on the outside. We're going to use him on the inside. We're going to move him around rather than just sticking him into the fucking Cole Beasley slots. I got one. I got one landing spot that I thought of yesterday and I'm all in on. Don't Where's Bruce me. Arians coaching this year? Tampa Bay. Which team loves to throw the fuck out of the ball? Tampa Bay. Who's losing to Sean Jackson and Adam Humphreys? I like I like where you're going with this. I like Dude, it. I don't like it from a Chris can, Godwin. Though. If you can turn Andy Isabella into that John Brown mold, use Chris Godwin as a Larry Fitzgerald more because he's like a more in the slot guy, and Mike Evans as that Michael Floyd role in an offense that passes like seventy percent of the time. It's dude, shit's gonna go wild. The it's NFC. Over for you bitches. 
<laughs> I, I like that. I like that spot. You're right. That's pretty good. Um, I love Chris Godwin. I, I, I hope they move him into the slot a little more this year. Uh, but that would be a deadly, deadly offense if they put Andy Isabella. Because you're right. Bruce Arians was coaching the Cardinals when – uh, John Brown had had his thousand yard season, so he knows how to use a guy like that. Um, that's a good that's a good comparison. So we'll have to see where he lands. I think that's probably best case scenario, um, and I think that his floor and ceiling would be pretty nice if he could land in Tampa Bay. So Andy Isabella gets a thumbs up from the, from Big Dog Nation. A couple of other under the radar wide receivers because you know we've talked about the big names and Nikhil Harris and the DK Metcalfs. Everyone knows about them. Are there any under the radar guys? people don't necessarily know about that they could probably grab in the second, third round of their dynasty drafts. Who are you liking right now? All right, number one's got to be Riley Ridley. Um, Stop that. What Stop are your thoughts you on him? Fucker. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, he's the Jack Doyle of wide receivers, and I'm going to be all in. Dude, it's too fucking early for you to piss me off like this right now. <laughs> it's too early. Dude, if you look at the player profiler, like his – the bar graphs, dude, they look like little anthills. They're, like, all, like, the fifth percentile. <laughs> it's absolutely disgusting. He's the goat. <laughs> he moves like a goat. Um, <laughs> I think my two favorite, like, under-the-radar guys who are going to fall real deep, one is Emmanuel Hall, who kind of, like, broke out at the combine. He ran a 4.39 at six foot two. And watching his tape, the only downside I really saw were his hands. And I know he's a receiver, and that's probably not a good thing. But in comparison to 2017, his 2018 season, he caught a lot more balls. If you watch his 2017 tape, the dude was dropping slant routes like it was his job. It was it was kind of disgusting, to be honest. But in 2018, he really stepped up. I think he surpassed – no, he, he came just short of 1,000 yards. I think he was like at 840. But he averaged like 20 yards a catch. The guy's extremely quick with the ball in his hands. He can run a full route tree. He's used all over the field. And he just absolutely burns defenses. And I was trying to find, like, a good comparison for him uh, to a guy who's in the league right now, and I couldn't find one. I was kind of pissed he wore the number 84 because he looks exactly like Keelan Cole. But he's absolutely, like, a complete burner in comparison. I think Paul Richardson is, like, a great comparison. Okay. I was actually – you know, you had mentioned Emmanuel Hall to me a few days ago, and I started watching the film – and to be honest with you, dude, like he's so quick. I feel like he's really quick off the line and he makes those tough sideline catches. And I'm like hesitant to say this, but I saw a little bit of uh, of Antonio Brown in, in like the quick twitch ways that he runs his routes. I, I don't want to like put him up there in terms of that comparison, but like you said 84 and I thought that's where you were going with it. But yeah, I mean, uh, Emmanuel Hall. <laughs> more conservative. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we're fading the fucking whole public here with this one. Um, yeah. I mean, his scores at the combine, 439, 40, 89th percentile weight adjusted speed score, 99th percentile burst score, 6'2", 200. So decent size um, and yards per reception in college, 22.4. Like you said, he was – he, he didn't put up the production, but 817 yards his junior year, 828 his senior year, uh, but he only played in limited games. He actually never played more than 10 games in a season, um, and I'm not actually sure why that is. I didn't really look at his injury history, but that's – I'm assuming why. Uh, I saw a hamstring, groin, and shoulder, I think. Okay, so that's definitely something to note, um, and he is coming out after his senior year as a four-year uh, college player, so he'll be like 22 by the time the season starts. So he's not too old of a prospect. Uh, yeah, I really liked what I saw in film, and he tested really well at the combine. I wish we saw, uh, you know, his agility score because I think that would have been really high, and I think that would have played well in his favor. Emmanuel Hall is definitely a guy to keep an eye on if he lands in a good spot. Hit me with another guy. Who else are we feeding the people with? All right, Antoine Wesley. The guy, he's built like Slender Man. He's 6'5", 185, and he has like a hunchback that's like – I don't want to make fun of the guy, but it's like odd to see a guy just dominate who's like running around who looks like he needs a cane. <laughs> he's like he's extremely fast for that size. He reminds me a lot of Tyrell Williams in that sense, where like he's a long, lanky guy, but he can win in contested catch situations. And he's like surprisingly strong. There are multiple times where he just catches the ball, and there's like five foot two cornerbacks coming at his legs, and he just like shakes them off and runs to the house, like arched over and all. He had a 37 inch vertical, and he didn't test in the 40 time. But, but like just looking at him, I'd say he's probably a low four fives guy, which for that height is like really good. And he put up over 1,400 yards, albeit it was, I think, his senior season. And he's in that Cliff Kingsbury offense. And we'll see how well he does with that, uh, with the Cardinals. I think the reason why he didn't really produce at a younger age was because they had Kiki Kuti there, who was like a perennial 1,000-yard receiver, and Dylan Cantrell, who hasn't done anything in the NFL, but he, like, he is on an NFL roster, which just speaks to his talent. 
Yeah. So I think you shouldn't just overlook him because he wasn't productive at a younger age. He's still pretty young. He's only uh, 21 years old and he won't be 22 until later into the season. So relatively speaking, he, he is a younger receiver and monster production last year, 88 receptions, 1400 yards and nine touchdowns. Um, and yeah, that's definitely something to take into consideration, the teammates around him, because it's hard to just go off of market share because you don't know, like at the time, you don't know what these receivers are going to turn into, but you have two NFL caliber prospects that you're also competing with, right? Kiki QT and Dylan Cantrell. So uh, I, I think that's certainly something to take into consideration with him. He's a weird looking dude now that I'm looking at his player profiler page and I wish he tested for the 40, but I like, <laughs> I like, what, I, I like what I see otherwise. Hairline says like 55 years old, but his age says 21. So I'm going to take their word. For that one. There was another guy. Do you have a third guy on this list? Or and his was- posture says 100. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a couple other guys that I'm like really big fans of. One, he's not a sleeper per se. Um, I'll leave him to second. First, I'll say David Sills. I'm pretty sure this was the kid that like when he was eight years old, he was he signed a scholarship to USC to be their quarterback. And then Sam Darnold was there and they're like, nah, fuck all that. But <laughs> <laughs> he, he like high points the ball. He's like not that slight. He ran a four, five, seven. Either way, it wasn't blazing fast. But he's a big white receiver, which might leave a bad taste in your mouth because we haven't seen one since Jordy Nelson. But the guy just – he high points the ball. He's got natural hands. And he had, like, 19 touchdowns in a West Virginia offense where, like, Will Greer really fell off towards the latter half of the season. I, I don't know. I think he could be, like, a big, like, red zone threat. He's not going to be, like, a 1,000-yard receiver, I don't think, in my eyes. But he could really provide, like, double-digit touchdown upside like Mike Williams did this past season. Jeez, yeah. I'm looking at his numbers. 15 15- – Receiving touchdowns senior year, 18 in his junior year. Just missed cracking 1,000 yards in both of those seasons. 6'3", 211. Ran a 4'5", 740, but he is big, so you're not expecting uh, monster numbers from that from that end. Uh, he'll be 23 years old in a few months, so someone to keep an eye on. That's pretty That's pretty, uh, pretty gnarly one you got there, man, throwing all the white boys out here. I, li- I like what you're doing. I see what you're doing over there. <laughs> He's kind of built like me, so I got a rep. <laughs> You're mad that it's not you on the player profiler page. <laughs> I'm mad I wasn't getting scholarships at 12. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. I feel like we used to hear about that all the time. It'd be like USC or Miami, it's like I'm offering scholarship to a seven-year-old. It's like what the? F- like, what I'm the surprised I didn't hear Dion in the booth when he was running his 40s. Like you know what, guys, this guy he got he got a scholarship at 13. <laughs> Those fucking NFL announcers are so funny to listen to. Like. <laughs> At the combine, like the takes that they have are just out of control. You see the one like two years ago, there was like an offensive lineman. He ran his 40s. Like, look at that guy's butt. Look at his bubble butt. <laughs> like, dude, chill out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't see that, but I'm not surprised whatsoever. <laughs> That's going to uh, wrap up today's episode. Make sure that you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be breaking down quarterbacks and tight ends next week, and then we'll start jumping into more dynasty and season long things outside of rookies but make sure you cop the draft guide bigdogsdraftguide.com is everything you need for your rookie draft your dynasty leagues the season long is up there too for pre-order that won't launch until later in the summer july 1st you will get it at a heavily we're talking dk metcalf discounted price if you go grab that shit today tomorrow anytime before march 25th uh that's it and we love y'all later noah